so yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for Abundant Green Networks in Reimagining Our Urban Spaces. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see all the little numbers of people watching go up. Uh, I'm Emma Pavins de Secchetti, and I'm from the Pesticide Action Network UK. And we're actually the only UK charity focused on tackling problems caused by pesticides. Uh, and so I'm joined today by four really inspiring speakers who are all transforming our cities in different ways. And I'm gonna introduce them now. Uh, so do wave back. Uh, so in alphabetical order, we have Ellen Miles. So Ellen is the founder of Nature is a Human Right, uh, that campaign, the campaign to make access to green space a recognized right for all, and also Dream Green, the social enterprise that educates and equips people to become guerrilla gardeners. And she'll explain what that is if you don't know at a later point. Uh, we have Sean Moxon. So Sean is a senior lecturer in sustainable design and a researcher in urban biodiversity at L London Metropolitan University and the founder of the award-winning Rewild My Street Urban Rewilding Campaign, which is what we'll specifically hear about today. We've got Paul Poesland. Uh, Paul is a barrister at the Garden Court Chambers and uh, the founder of Lawyers for Nature. He represents people trying to protect nature and he's also an advocate for the rights of nature the idea of giving legal rights and personality to the natural world. Really interesting. And then last but definitely not least, we've got Carol Wright. So Carol is a project manager, community gardener, beekeeper, and proud South Londoner. She's the founder of the Black Outside Festival uh, that started in 2020, uh, which is a Black-led space uh, to decolonize the garden and celebrate being proudly and safely Black outside. So um, yeah, welcome to everyone. Welcome to our speakers. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the last event in our series uh, that we've put on, Reassembling Our Cities, which celebrates uh, the diversity in our cities and in our gardens and all the incredible projects that people like our speakers today have set up to engage with this nature. Uh, but it's actually also an opportunity coming from Pan UK to highlight the fact that pesticides and the continued use of pesticides in these spaces actually undermines a lot of these efforts. Um, and we really see going pesticide free as the first step, uh, sorry, going pesticide free in our urban spaces as the first step in protecting these spaces and helping all these projects flourish. So when we talk about pesticides, you probably associate that to agriculture most of the time, but actually our councils and land managers uh, do continue to spray these toxic chemicals in parks, in playgrounds, in hospital grounds, in cemeteries, road verges, pavements, uh, and around schools and homes. So really the list is, is uh, inclusive. And that doesn't even take into account the 539 pesticides that are still allowed for use in uh, private gardening in the UK. So that's a lot of chemicals that we're potentially being exposed to. And these chemicals are applied for cosmetic reasons. So to keep our streets neat and tidy uh, and our gardens manicured, but really it just ends up creating these sterile spaces that are just devoid of biodiversity or lawns that we actually can call green deserts because it's just these blades of grass with nothing else really. Um, and so, as I said, so these chemicals also expose humans to potentially really serious health effects. Um, it also is dangerous for our pets. That'll, yeah, that'll be too close to the pavements after spraying. And then of course, it's further depleting our dwindling biodiversity. So we've all heard of the uh, insect apocalypse and things like that. So that's directly contributing to that. Um, so yeah, so 83% of the UK population actually lives in urban spaces. Uh, and we've actually covered this a lot in our previous talks, but it's really important to understand how much we need for our well-being to have access to green spaces. Um, and many of our large cities do have some green spaces in quite a high percentage. But you know, it's really important to consider how these spaces are managed and, um, and protected. It's also at this point really crucial to highlight that not everyone will have equal access to these green spaces. Um, so with more and more people moving into cities, they need to be greener, wilder, and inclusive for all. So that brings me to our first question for our speaker, Carol. Um, who I'd like us to kick us off with the question of who currently has access to urban nature and what does that look like? Oh, you're on mute, Carol. Had to happen. <laughs> right, go. I'm muted. I'll repeat what I said. I'm going to answer that question with a slide presentation, if that's okay. Got to be so quick. <laughs> um, and this is the access that I see and that I encounter in, in, in urban environments. So I'm just gonna quickly do this, do that, and do that. 
and hopefully you can see this. Yeah. Yeah. It's All good. right. So starting off, so this is where I'm talking from, and this is where I manage to community garden. So this is a uh, South Bank, um, South East London, Zone One, and. Um, so this area is known for um, Charles Dickens, Octavia Hill. So social reformers area, so steeped in history, but also um, you would imagine not that green. And this is where I'm talking from in particular. This is a 150 year old uh, housing association, Peabody Blackfriars. And this is an engraving of this estate when it was about three years old. And in the middle, we're very infant London plane trees. So the planners and architects were aware of the value of um, the nature, even in these flats, which were built for the working poor, because that's how Peabody and Guinness Trust and um, other housing associations were set up. This is it today. So this is it 149 years old. So this was taken this morning from my kitchen window. So that you can see those London plane trees are now 150 years old in two months time. And um, you can see they had built into these flats, these railings on the window ledges for people to garden on their windowsill. And each of the flats surround, uh, go, surround squares. So they built this green infrastructure 150 years ago and prior to that. So this is to give you an inkling of the urban environment um, which many of the flats in this part of uh, London have. So there's tarmac. So I've pointed out block R, block P and block S and they all can see a garden, community garden which is now 10 years old built on tarmac because that's often the reality of gardening around here. It's tarmac, it could be um, some green space which um, covered bomb damage sites. So there was a lot of bomb damage to this particular part of London. So a lot of the soil is imported. And here we have um, residents taking matters into their own hands. Um, so this used to be, this uh, border here, used to just be grasses, but the residents have taken over the square outside the community garden. You can see the gates of the community garden ahead and the window ledges. So, Peabody has um, rented out the lower ground flats for commercial use. And the residents asked the occupants if it's okay to put flower pots with herbs and things. And people said, yeah, go for it. So that's what happened there. And so this is the garden. This is um, Peabody Blackfriars Community Garden, which is 10 years old. And um, 14 households have access to this garden because that's how many raised beds could be put into this triangle tarmac space a decade ago. And you can see the back of the flats there. There are 220 flats and I'm standing with Faruka Goro at Black Outside House Plant Festival. So 14 plots, but how we have the other residents interact and if in fact anybody from neighboring housing is to come to events in this space. So that could be herbs, that could be biodiversity, that could just be come and relax and take in nature. And this is what we had last month because we've had a heavy police presence during the COVID lockdowns. So, and it became a case of who has access to not just nature, but public, public domain. So we had two dispersal orders on this estate and so had a resident consultation event with senior management at Peabody, the Metropolitan Police, but most importantly, the residents. And I had these um, leaflets printed out to let people know what wildflowers there are on the estate. And here we go. So these are the wildflowers. So these are around the community garden because Ginkgo, the contractors for Peabody, and we have a very good relation with them, insist on glyphosate and had murdered many walls of, of uh, ivy on the say-so of Peabody officers, but we're having those negotiations with them, you know, so that the, because the residents are clearly upset by that, it's reduced biodiversity and the birdsong. 
And this is on Brookwood Community Garden where there are mushrooms. And this is literally five minutes away. So this garden is 14 years old and it has a fruiting hedge and it has um, ringed by bay trees and um, people are free to come and forage. And why I've included this picture is because there are untold complaints that nature has escaped over the railing of this particular community garden and it needs to be cut back. It needs to be controlled. It's a nuisance. People can have their eye out. I quote the local councillors. It's an ongoing conversation. But what is lovely is the um, cherry plums are ignoring this and have formed a really nice arch for people to walk past and pick and forage. And the same goes for the mushrooms and the apple trees and everything in this garden. This is open access. And I end with this quote from Marjorie Carter, urban revitalization strategist who's based in New York and whose work I greatly admire. You shouldn't have to leave your neighborhood to live in a better one. And to me, that's what sums up community gardening and access to nature in the particular urban environments in which I work and live. So that's uh, my answer to what it looks like from my perspective and the communities um, that I work with. Thanks, Carol. It's I feel like there's a really interesting theme. I mean, it's really beautiful to see like the the, ac the actual work and the gardens and the, the pamphlets that you've made as well. And I feel like there's a theme of sort of people and plants sort of going past the railings, you know, and, and reclaiming this this tarmac and these spaces. So it's it's really incredible to see. And leads quite nicely to uh, the next question for Ellen, which is how do you democratize nature? How do you increase that access and um, yeah, get people into these spaces? And thanks, Emma, and thanks, Carol. I want to visit your garden. <laughs> it's great. Um, so in terms of democratizing nature, I kind of frame this in the sense of giving everyone a say um, in how urban nature is created and how it's maintained. Um, so in order to do this, we need to effectively engage both sides and the debate, so the developers and the policymakers from the top down and also the communities from the ground up. Um, and as someone who's worked for council, um, similar to what Carol was saying, I can tell you that um, decisions about green space are too often being made in like an ivory tower situation. It's based on what's going to be easy and um, people in an office a mile up the road um, from the communities they're ostensibly helping are deciding what that community needs for them. Um, often without asking them uh, and more often than not this uh, is going to be the wrong thing so you end up with benches in places no one wants to sit um, green spaces that young girls and women don't feel included by or even safe in um, herb gardens that are totally wrong for the local community's cuisines that kind of thing uh, either that or you end up with green gentrification where the local communities are being forced out because the spaces have been designed to appeal to like a wealthier whiter audience rather than serving the communities who already live there and maybe have been living there for generations um, so if we want to give people a sense of belonging and ownership um, and create green spaces that people actually want to use and that will be used we need to be actively bringing those communities into the planning decisions um, so Hafsa Hafaji who is a brilliant horticulturalist and a community worker from Leicester who I have the pleasure of working with um, has given me a real insight into this and she talks a lot about how different communities have different needs and different preferences so for instance for South Asian communities rather than having very separate small picnic tables um, there should be spaces for large gatherings for extended families um, and different communities lean to different kinds of sports different recreations there's no point having a cricket green or a football pitch or a basketball net if that's not what the local young people want to play with um so yes yeah, so before designing and creating these green spaces there needs to be a community committee and another person i work with um called taisha and hayden smith has created a social enterprise called grow to know which exists for exactly that purpose of being the kind of um connecting dots so grow to know acts uh, as a midpoint between the resource provider which is the council of developers the people with the money bags and the, the kind of tools um and the community who have the ideas um and the needs and so the team, the Grow to Know team, kind of carry out an in-depth community consultation in a really engaging, interactive way that people want to get involved in, um, rather than just putting a microsite up somewhere and saying it's there and no one goes to look at it. Um, and then they'll go and design the new green space based on what they've actually heard from people. Um, and then they'll even share this design back with the community, get feedback on it, at which point they incorporate this into the final design. Um, and then even when it comes to building, um, they sort out the hard 
landscaping, which is like the structural elements, digging the beds, setting paths out and stuff, but they'll run a day for the soft landscaping planting, basically, where the community comes to get stuck in and put things into the ground. And we'll often kind of say, well, where do you want us to go? Um, and one of the big concerns about creating new green spaces is the cost to maintain them. Um, yeah, and again, as Carol said, you know, councils prefer things that are low maintenance. Obviously, if it's just tarmac or concrete, that's just going to be chilling there for years. If you put in a new green space, there's this anxiety then around, well, no one's going to no one's going to maintain it. We'll put this in and people will just let it go to rack and ruin um, and it'll become a health hazard, etc. But if you get the community to take part in creating the space and designing it and building it, they're automatically going to respect it a lot more and feel a sense of actual ownership over it. It's not been imposed on them. It was created in collaboration with them. So they'll feel like they belong to it or that it belongs to them. And that's when you get people who really care about the space and want to ensure that it is maintained and invested in making sure that it is looked after and can be passed down to future generations. Um, so local authorities need to trust people more and give them a platform and a voice and the resources to actually help out. And we need to shed this misconception that residents aren't capable of actually doing things. You know, there's some real natural talent in communities. Um, and that's what we need to change from the top down and from the ground up. We need to be putting pressure on these policymakers to overturn current misconceptions and laws when it comes to land use. For instance, the people aren't allowed to just create community gardens in abandoned corners of their neighborhood without permission because the council owns that land, you know. So I am about to launch a campaign called License to Plant, um, which mi mimics something they have in Paris where the government allows citizens to get a permit to grow things in abandoned patches of city soil. For instance, like a road verge or, or a bare tree pit, um, which are just going to waste. Um, and I run a local guerrilla gardening group. Um, and as Emma said, um, guerrilla gardening, as I define it anyway, um, is about planting in public places with a purpose. Uh, it's not strictly always legal, but that's kind of the point, you know. Um, what we're doing is we're supporting biodiversity. We're raising awareness about land justice, self-sufficiency, community mental health. Um, and it's a great way for people that don't have the privilege of having their own garden to be able to garden. And it's kind of making a statement about this, you know, why do we have this great abandoned lot when it could be doing so much good for the community? Um, and more often than not, once you've done those things, it's not even a case of asking for forgiveness, not permission, because you're not asking for forgiveness. They're giving you their thanks is what tends to happen once you prove that you do have the investment and like the interest in the kind of community together to, to create it and to look after it. Um, so those are my two main things. I think there's many more things we can do to democratize nature um, besides that, but I'd say community consultation and grassroots action are the most important. Thanks, Ellen. Really neat to recap for us at the end there as well. It's really helpful. And you touched a lot on sort of what's legal and what's not, and I think that's a really interesting sort of segue into the next question of, you know, what, what rights do we have currently? What, um, and so Paul, if you could sort of take that of, yeah, what, what frameworks are currently in place to encourage nature in our cities and to have people have access to this nature? Um, I'd actually like to talk a bit about the legal frameworks later on, because actually, um, ironically for a lawyer, I'd like to talk to you, following on from what Ellen said, about some maybe less legal ways of doing things and a practical project that I'm involved in. Yeah, I know, right? Um, and actually, it's a shame we're not in, well, it's a shame we're not in a room, because I asked you to guess uh, where I was. Uh, right now. Uh, behind me is a, I think, a 25 foot, 30 foot high wall of reeds and three acres of impenetrable tidal salt marsh, like rich with the sound of bird songs. Um, it's incredible. You'd probably think I'm out in the countryside. I'm actually uh, in zone four in London, um, sandwiched between what is alleged to be uh, by the council. And you can see the tower blocks over there, I think one of the most deprived estates in London and just over there about 50 metres away uh, is the North Circular and the constant hum of that um, and about a 10-15 minute walk from Barking Town Centre. Um, so there's this incredible piece of nature here, like nature doesn't necessarily need a framework, it just needs a space <laughs> just to be given a space. Um, but it's also quite interesting how this, this project came about I guess. Um, so the river roading where we're based. I have to give you a little walk because unfortunately I can't see, you can't see through the reeds, but it'd be nice to show you the river. Just through there, can you see that? Yeah, it's not great. But that's, um, it's the third largest river in London, but one that most people don't really know about. Um, and uh, up to about five years ago, it had basically no one in charge of it. <clears throat> the council didn't have the time or the resources to look after it. Um, and it was just kind of forgotten and a bit unloved. Um, and so I moved here 
um, by myself to set up a charity and a project to restore this river and to bring public access back to the river. Um, and we now have maybe a better view there. We now have seven boats um, and everyone who lives here um, is a part of the community and the charity. And so everyone pays a license fee, which funds our work and also volunteers 12 hours a month to the project. Um, so I'll just very briefly, I, I wanna go to a walk just briefly outside of our moorings as well, just to show you some of the things we've done because it really touches upon a few of the issues raised already. We have, we have a little boardwalk here because basically the part, the place where we're, we're moored here, this boardwalk is normally if we didn't have this, we'd be wading up to way steep when it's high tide, because it's still so tidal here, which is quite incredible to think of. Um, so this is our path, which we now maintain. It's a public path. I say our path. <laughs> we look after it. This is actually a public, uh, public pathway here. And before we... Some technical difficulties that I would say are definitely worth it to get to see someone outside walking around by a river. Quite amazing it's lasted this long in a way. Um, <laughs> we might give him just a second to come closer to where his Wi-Fi is. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, we might come back to Paul um yeah let's let's come back to him when he comes back the river is not going anywhere um so <laughs> I suppose a little bit more concrete that was amazing to see I'm sure we'll see the river again um but yeah so we were hearing about all these different ways of creating access um and I wanted to ask Carol um yeah, so there's there's these ways of creating access and there's sort of putting putting spaces into place, but how do you actually encourage people and engage people to feel safe? And I guess that's something that um, Ellen sort of touched upon as well, that you know, women and maybe women of color don't feel particularly as safe in certain spaces. There's so many reasons why certain communities might not feel engaged. So yeah, sort of touching upon that and in your work, how have you sort of um, approached that? Um. I think it's different for, per site, actually. It's an interesting one. With this the site here, it's in an enclosed space. So people, you have to have a key. So that kind of limits access. You're kind of more exposed on Brookwood Triangle, which was commissioned by Tate Modern. And um, so anyone can walk in there. So you're very aware. You, you, you've got a heightened sense of awareness in that, in that space. And there were things which are said to people as well, like we always make people aware of their safety. So we always say, you know, if it's your work by yourself, move the garden here, lock the gate, because we have a high percentage of homeless people and people who have drug dependency. And that's just the nature of where we are. So we have to kind of be a bit savvy and look about self care in these spaces. Navigating, um, colour yeah <laughs> access because it, that comes really from authority authority really don't care sometimes to see um bpop people managing a space that's a whole other time another pan conversation really on when you seemingly have um a position of authority and how that can be eroded very quickly if you don't play the game and that's why I put that picture in of the hedge, because it's all good and well saying, yes, we encourage diversity and everything. Else. But the minute you displease certain people in authority, you, you really do see it. It's who, who's given access to build on the land as well. So it's kind of a really major thing to look at, because who really has access to these community gardens, even when you build them? What's the composition of the people who will get access to apply for grants and then given the permission? Yeah, because we went, it, it was relatively easy, the two spaces to get permission for to, you know, the tarmac. And no, we can't dig down into the tarmac because we're in a former industrial area here. So all the soil is contaminated with prisons, workhouses, 
this is the nature of SE1, tanneries, tin factories. So everything, the soil is imported, you know? So access, safety are always high on our list. The things that are, are, we continually look about when we're working in the spaces, who comes into the spaces and we always have to be hyper aware because we're in a better area with a high footfall here. Yeah. So yeah, always a, a navigating space and particularly that we have the Metropolitan Police on the estate as well. So we're in kind of a bit of a, a yeah, situation here from COVID. Yeah, so I don't know, that's a rambling answer work in progress around these parts you know who has access to these community gardens mm. and how are they managed and who's allowed to manage them but I like what Paul said because we're not waiting on people to tell us to do a thing either so I'm yeah. um, you know I grew up in squat culture and, and sound system culture so I'm from base culture so to me you know adventure playgrounds will spring up so when people talk to me about ASB on this estate I said you have no idea what 12 speaker boxes at full base sounds like that's <laughs> a good morning but you can't do that because huh? we got the met so yeah okay. I mean it's interesting to hear that you know it's it'll be different for each site in a way like I I, I like that answer and you know it's it's yeah, just it's different each site's yeah. got its own character and its own supporting yeah. network cast of, of supporters which is grown up around them but we, we're interlinked we're like a web and that's what I love and it's very organic and so mm. we bring plants to them they bring plants to us and it's the same with food cultural food very important so when we have these events on this estate you're looking at Dorawa you're looking at vegan Turkish you're looking at old set of Nigerian Somali English everybody everybody chips in with some food and mint, mint from Morocco, strawberries from Portugal, and that's that's it. So you've got like nationalists in the community garden alone here, and we've had Nepalese grandmothers at Brookwood showing us how to sow things. We've had okra seeds from Ghana, and edamame from Japan. Wow. So that's that's the nature of what this SE one is like. Mm. Yeah, I might um, bring us back to. East somewhere. I don't know. Can I finish off my bit? I, I made the incredibly basic error of not taking the phone I was streaming off with me on my walks. As soon as I got too far from the mooring, it cut off. It's disastrous. <laughs> uh, I'll try and finish. I'll try and finish off quickly. But basically, what, what we've done here is that every winter we just chop back the brambles, which would otherwise completely take over the path, and we don't get rid of them entirely. So the other side of the embankment still has them, so all the wildlife has them. And then in the midst of that, we've basically just had this riot of, we haven't sown anything, we've done, we've sown nothing here at all. And we now have like a riot of wild flowers, herbs, trees, all self-sown. The ones we've tried to plant have actually all died and the ones that have sown themselves are living amazingly. Uh, we've got mugwort here, which I often put in tea. Um, we've got this massive self-sown apple tree here where people um, come and take it from the winter, um, sorry, in the autumn. And I, I don't know if you can see it next to my height here, but this um, fennel is like higher than me, completely self-sown. And this path got a huge amount of um, public traffic during, especially during lockdown. Like people were past it all the time. And it's actually probably the only bit of wild nature that's publicly accessible to many of the people that live around here in what's otherwise a really urban area. Or there's parks, but it's always kind of very pesticided, mown back, nothing wild. And I think it's so important to have a wild space that's actually um, close to people. I'm just coming up now to show you before I finish the thing that I've, or that we've done as part of this project that I think has had, I'm most proud of and has had the most use. And it's actually the most simple of all. It's just one bench, which cost, I think 50 pounds. We took the, the stumps, the legs are from stumps we found in the river. The top is a, uh, sleeper that we got from a local DIY store. We installed it in about half a day and it just overlooks this reed patch here. And um, this bench gets so much use. Um, 
you know, I've seen every time I cycle past here on a summer's evening, it's amazing to see what's going on. I've seen relationships start. I've seen relationships end. I've seen people chatting to their families in probably very distant places, people having picnics, kids smoking weed, just like that, just that place to go and be in nature close to you, I think is so important. And like so much life happens on this bench and on the one just around the corner. And um, yeah, it's something so simple. Um, yeah, so I think that's important, just having simple access to spaces that are genuinely wild. And just to reiterate, we may come on to this a bit later, like none of this had permission at all, the entire project. Um, and if I'd asked for permission, we wouldn't have got it. But now the council have been around, the head leader of the council has been around to the moorings and has had his photo taken here because he loves what we're doing so much. So I think there's a thing to be said if what you're doing is good to just kind of get on and do it because councils will then catch up because they see it's worthwhile. If you try and sell it to them in advance, it will often be a hard sell. So I'm very much a fan of the get on and do it style of uh, bringing nature into cities and bringing nature to people. Amazing. And it's so incredible to see. I think everyone everyone watching is like, I will be going to that bench and, <laughs> and visiting your project. That looks incredible. And yeah, I think that links really well to, to Sean of this idea. I mean, I guess it's, yeah, there's all these wild spaces and hilarious to hear that all the ones you've sown have died is the classic thing. And all the ones that are self-sown have of course thrived and survived on so little. Um, but yeah, this idea of, you know, there's there's these spaces that we can go to, but we can also bring these spaces to, to us and we can also create these pockets of wilderness in our, you know, in our front gardens or in our on our balconies or wherever. Um, and yeah, we can bring more wildlife to us. So it's also these spaces that we that we share. So I, interestingly, we really focused on the, the social aspect and the human aspect. But there's also this element of of access and creating spaces for wildlife, which is kind of what you were talking about, Paul, of, of yeah, needing spaces that are wild, not just these manicured sort of moan spaces. So yeah, Sean, if you could tell us a bit about your project and how you know it's about real wilding and, and really bringing wildlife as well into those spaces. Yeah, sure. So I'm an architect, so I need pictures. So I'm just going to share my pictures. Hopefully. Yeah, so um, I think urban nature should be for wildlife too and um, my project is called rewild my street and this is our kind of vision for taking um, a london street quite different to the one we've seen before but any london streets filling it with greenery and then allowing this kind of diversity of, of wildlife to come back and why we need to do that is because uh, wildlife is in serious decline. So 41% of UK species are in strong or moderate decline. 15% are extinct or threatened with extinction. But it also benefits us because residents of more biodiverse areas as well as greener areas feel, feel better, have better well-being. This is my garden, by the way my amateurish photo of my foxy friend um, and how we could do this is to rethink our spaces as kind of mini habitats for nature so this is a, a sort of plan looking down at, at that kind of London street of, of sort of Victorian terraced housing and thinking about how you can recreate these spaces sometimes quite radically in some of the proposals shown in the street where you have fewer cars and you have a kind of play park and you have some quite sort of serious stuff, but all working with the existing um, infrastructure so it could all be retrofitted. And then thinking about the back gardens as, as kind of continuous mass of land with gaps between fences that provide this kind of critical mass of different types of habitat. And then also thinking about how we can make room for particular species in some of these spaces. So this is a kind of cross section again through that same sort of street and thinking about how you can adapt an existing home, um, an existing garden and an existing street to create spaces that these kind of wildlife can, can inhabit. And that doesn't need to be um, 
doesn't need to require owning a house or, or renting a house. That could be done in a small space, in a, even a, a balcony for a flat or in a kind of community garden, as we've seen earlier. And it's just thinking about how you can cram all these kind of space saving, well designed features that can attract wildlife into even these small spaces and thinking about the, the types of animals that you can realistically attract. So that, that's my answer to, to that question of how, how and why to attract wildlife to these spaces. So I'm going to stop sharing. I love it. It's so, yeah, it's so incredible. And it just changes, I mean, for me in particular, it just changes my day to, to notice a bird or to, to really start noticing what's around. So we, we have some um, flock of great tits that's always around and then a pair of goldfinches as well. And it really, yeah, it brings my day alive. Um, but then there's also the sort of other side of the penny, which is a very real concern, which is sort of, uh, you know, getting attached. I have actually this issue personally, getting attached to a tree in my street and finding out that the tree is going to be felled or, you know, starting a project, uh, it's tragic, starting a project, um, you know, like guerrilla gardening and starting to plant things and finding that the council sprayed it with pesticides or a verge that you really enjoy because it's full of wildflowers and then the council or you know, someone who manages that land has then mowed it and there's no more insects. So it's, yes, it's this really sort of mixed feeling and it kind of brings me to Paul of asking you more on a legal side, sort of what can we do to counter that? I know you've worked a lot with helping people who um, protect urban trees and other spaces like that, but also in rights of nature of these spaces having their own, you know, inherent rights in themselves, because there is this cultural attachment uh, to these to these trees or to these animals, but there's also there's the inherent value that they have. I'm really glad you came to you because when you mentioned the really sad thing about losing a tree, I was sort of dying to jump in there. So thank you. Um, yeah, so the, I've got two sort of main projects in my life really. So the first is in a very practical way is the roading project. Um, and the second is my legal work. So um, I founded Lawyers for Nature a couple of years ago. Um, after working for the Sheffield tree protesters, who, as many of you may know, did an incredible job basically battling their council with everything thrown at them for about two or three years to save 17,000 street trees. And they won, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, nature is definitely, and urban nature particularly, is threatened left, right and centre. Um, and one of the things that I've really learned in the last couple of years is that we need to combine a very principled and a very practical approach and the two need to work in tandem. So on, on a sort of principle ideological level, our relationship to nature in this country is, is fundamentally broken because we see nature as a dead thing to be exploited for our own ends. Um, and nature has no, although we have environmental law, that's always normally for most always for, for human uses. So we, we don't want to pollute rivers because we want to use them. We don't want to chop down too many trees. They look nice for us. Um, but actually nature itself has no legal standing and no legal rights. Now, it may seem weird to say, oh, I wanna start giving human rights to trees, but we've actually, as a species gone further than that, we, we've actually given legal rights and standing to companies which are completely fictional. We just literally made them up. And we managed to do that 200 years before we managed to give legal rights to living things, which we rely on for our um, survival. And which for instance, in the case of rivers have been here long before humans ever came to these islands and will be here probably long after we are gone. So th there's a growing movement around the world to give rights to nature. And I really want to bring that into the UK. But the problem is, is that um, we uh, politically, that's going to be difficult because it will take an act of parliament and you know, we can barely keep our existing environmental protections, let alone trying to get the Tories to say, yeah, let's give legal rights and standing to trees. And we could, I guess, sort of fling our hands up and say, well, let's give up. But my idea, and I think it's one that's gaining traction, is to combine the principled and the practical. So to get people to work out what they think the rights of nature should be, declare those rights, and then peacefully pledge to uphold them. Now, I can't say that's always going to work. We won't save every tree, we can't protect every river. But I do think it will have a much bigger uh, impact than what we have currently. So the first declaration of rights um, uh, was on the River Cam last month, and I want to do it on the roading soon. So we'll basically draft um, the rights of the river and then um, get 
well, then then we pledge to uphold them. And we already are, you know, when people are trying to put sewage in the river, which previously has happened without any anyone stopping them, we've already, through various actions, managed to get Thames Water to, to stop doing it. And, you know, sometimes to uphold the rights, we can't use the law, we have to go in and do it ourselves. So we, want to, we don't want the river to be full of rubbish. Well, I tried getting the council to do it, they didn't, so we went and did it ourselves. And for each different right, there's different ways that we can, in the here and now, make that right a reality. And I think there's something quite magic in the combination of that very principled ideological approach of saying, I believe in the rights of nature, but combining it with a practical idea of, and here is how I'm going to make my belief in those rights manifest. Um, and I, I, I think it would take a while to go into more depth in this, but um, I just want to bring it back to, to trees and how we can, for instance, help save them. So, you know, we can declare the rights of trees, but what happens if they go to take a tree? Well, there are numerous different ways that that trees can be protected even in the current legal framework. So what was really fascinating about Sheffield was the law was completely against them. I lost almost every case I did for them because the law said that those trees, the council had the right to chop the trees down. But by peaceful direct action, some people standing under a tree for two years, every single day, every single day for two years, they gave up their lives. They managed to save 17,000 trees and effectively changed the law because the council was like, we have the right to take these trees, but." Practically, we can't do it. I just want to end with one very specific example here. I woke up uh, last year, about 18 months ago, to hear the sound of chainsaws, like way too close to my boat. And um, I was asleep and uh, it was springtime. So I was in my uh, bunny onesie, which is what I sleep in because it's kind of nice and warm. And I literally rushed out of the boat in this bunny onesie and could see a, a giant poplar tree just over there. Uh, that tree there was about to be chopped down. And I said, don't do it. And they were like, well, we're going to. And I was like, and it's a public footpath, so I have a right to stand there. So I sort of pushed amongst the nettles on this public footpath and stood under the tree and said, I'm not leaving until you go. This tree is staying um, while dressed in a pink bunny onesie. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where that made it more or less likely to succeed. Um, but um, and eventually they gave up and they left and they left the tree and uh, it's now there. And I'm hoping to get a tree preservation audit soon. And um, just this spring, I was very proud to see that a crow was nesting in it, uh, a tree that otherwise wouldn't be there. So. Um, yeah, there's many ways that we can peacefully try and protect as much nature as we can, even within the current legal framework. Thanks, Paul. I do see a question about, didn't they call the police, that I'm actually quite curious to ask as well. Um, maybe you can come back. Maybe you can just say quickly, did, what, did they call the police? Did they? Oh, you're muted, Paul. No, I mean, there's... there's, there's... No, there's no right. There's, there's nothing they could have done. I mean, in that instance, actually, there was, I was doing nothing illegal because this path right, here is a public, public footpath. footpath and you, you have a right to stand on a public footpath. That's what, if the police come, I'd be like, I'm standing on a public footpath and doing nothing unlawful. If they want to mm -hmm. chop the tree, they have to get a closure order of the public footpath. And then, then it gets yeah. more interesting. But a lot of the time initially, especially for street trees, just stand underneath them. Don't, don't listen to what they say. You have a right to be on the street. Um, and if, if, if they haven't got a closure order for the street, then stand. And you know, that's, that's what people did in Sheffield. And then it got much more interesting because the council then went to get injunctions to make what was otherwise legal, illegal. And then it, <laughs> that was a whole other journey in itself. But the basic thing is, if, if you're not trespassing, you have a right to stand under a tree. It's on a public Ooh. highway. So yeah, and that, that's why it was sort of a bit of a weird standoff because- Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Paul. And, and, and crucially, yeah. I think the key thing to highlight there is, you know, I could have I could have gone away and then they chopped the tree down and written angry letters to my councillor and try to like do a campaign about it. But the tree's gone. Yeah. Whereas yeah. now the fact on the ground is that the tree is there. It's quite a, an interesting one, again, from my situation with the tree outside my house. But um, yeah, incredible to ask. And yeah, I just had to jump in with that question because it was too, too relevant. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's very interesting to hear. Um, yeah, how much in a way as well our, our sort of architects and town planners need to really include these this nature into the into the design of our cities in the first place and really take them into account. Um, and, you know, and take this inherent value into account, but also take in the cultural value into account. I think that's it's incredibly important to, to, to acknowledge how important it is for humans uh, and how we get attached to it. And I kind of want to, in a way, we haven't really touched upon this, and I want to give a bit of space to Ellen to tell us a little bit of why is that access to nature important in the end? What is it actually that, that makes it crucial? Um, oh, so many reasons. <laughs> I know it's one of those very simple, <laughs> devastating questions. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, there is the whole kind of, you know, sense of 
belonging and the spiritual connection that we need as as animals and I think we sometimes forget that we are part of nature you know we're organic beings as well but just the um the science behind this is is really fascinating is growing you know I, I know we all kind of learned in school that going outdoors gives you vitamin d and like it gives you for your eye sign and that gives you room to run around and obviously plants are vital for cleaning our air um but now we know a lot more than we knew even 10 to 15 years ago you know in 2005 there was like 60 studies on the subject and now there's thousands um and this sort of mushroom body of body of evidence is saying that having daily contact with green leafy vegetated environments is vital to our health and happiness and so scientists are comparing it to getting regular exercise sleeping well eating a balanced diet um and yet at the same time as this body of evidence is growing so is our distance from nature it's a really painful irony and this goes for so many aspects of our welfare so obviously mental health i doubt many of you escaped that huge wave of recognition um that green open spaces are like a pressure relief valve for these frantic cooped up minds when we went into lockdown after lockdown after lockdown and green space is a mood lifter it's a stress reducer it's an anger assuager a confidence booster um but beyond this it can even relieve and prevent debilitating mental illnesses and psychoses so um for instance in urban areas with high tree density um there's a 30 percent drop in depression rates um compared to those with low tree density and that's even accounting for other kind of socioeconomic and demographic factors um, and then common sense also tells us that um, we should head to nature, we need to clear our head um, and think more clearly. Um, and studies are backing up this fact that green space fuels our brain power. Um, it helps our memory focus, problem solving abilities um, throughout our whole lives. As we get older, it staves off Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and when we're younger, it helps our cognitive development as well. So children living in greener areas have uh, an IQ 2.6 points higher than children growing up in um, less green urban areas essentially um, and then it's not just the mind and the brain the whole of the rest of the body the, the, the natural health service as some people like to call it um, works its magic through absolutely every every system and every corner of our bodies it staves off all kinds of physical ailments makes us way fitter more resilient to illness it's brilliant for our immune systems um, we've seen that office like office workers take less sick days if there's just office plants in the office. Um, we've even seen that hospital patients will recover faster and feel less pain if they can see foliage from their windows, which is crazy. Um, there's not really a corner of our bodies that it doesn't touch and um, unsurprisingly given its extensive influence over our health, several studies have found that having greater exposure to nature means a longer life, um, which is all obviously fantastic news for people who have the privilege of living in really green, nature-rich, verdant neighborhoods, but there are 11 million people in the UK living in E-rated um, nature deprived environments, which basically means things are very gray, deserts of continuous urban fabric. Um, it's not a nice environment to be in and it's terrible for people's um, well being. And 2.7 million people don't have any green space within um, accessible walking distance, which is defined as like a 10 minute walk. Obviously, if you have a disability, then that's not going to become even less accessible. Um, so this lack of local greenery is linked to basically just the inverse of all the benefits I've just described, mental illness, cognitive impairment, higher crime rates as well, actually, because of the way that it's like messes with our heads, um, shorter lifespans, a number of serious health conditions. Um, and as we know, it's like a huge social imbalance. So wealthier, whiter areas tend to be the greener and leafier ones with the lovely well-funded parks and private gardens, yada, yada. Whereas it's communities of color, low-income communities, um, those are the ones who are living in places that don't have this kind of funding. And given that these communities suffer all kinds of other <laughs> injustices, socio-economic imbalances, it's precisely these marginalized communities who actually need more nature um, and these kind of free well-being benefits that it provides. So access to nature is important because it can redress social imbalances, um, is absolutely essential to our well-being. You know, health is wealth. The current distribution of green space is, is making the rich richer and the poor poorer in that respect. Um, so there's there's all of those kind of very uh, practical, I suppose, well well being um, reasons that it's uh, as I say, access to nature should be a human right. Um, and then on the kind of more principled sense, I kind of almost in line with, with what Paul was talking about, it's important to connect people to nature so they re respect it, um, so that they think nature should have these rights because you can't care about something that you don't know. You can't love something that you have no idea about it. So for the sake of the environment, yes, and for nature in itself, which again loops back to social justice because climate um, degradation is a social inequality as well. Um, we need to be connecting people to nature 
because people who are connected to nature act in more pro-environmental ways. So there's a study last year of 24,000 people um, and people who had greater access to nature were much more pro-environmental. They were recycling, walking or cycling rather than driving, doing environmental volunteering, all of these kind of things. So it might seem obvious, but you can't love what you don't know. <laughs> And by bringing nature to everyone, we can create the generation of climate activists that we desperately need. Um, so, and then again, also that just loops back around. So it, it's, I, I haven't even gotten onto creativity and social bonds and all this stuff, but I won't take up too much more of your time. It's, it's absolutely essential to our humanity to have access to nature. Thanks, Ellen. That's incredibly well said. And yeah, I feel like there's a lot more more there to find out about. So do follow follow everyone on social media. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess it, it kind of brings me to want to get a bit practical and think, OK, yeah, this, I'm convinced. And how do I do that? And Sean, um, yeah, again, your project is all about as well, like bringing this bringing nature into our streets and being able to really change that on a very local, personal level. Um, and, and maybe not in such a yeah organized way, maybe just already just on the individual level, we can make a change. Um, yeah, definitely through small actions. And I'm going to share my screen again and hopefully pick up where I left off. Hopefully. OK, yeah, so I mean, that's the whole idea of my project really is to empower people to take small actions in whatever space they've got that can add up and make a real um, sort of accumulative difference. Um, so one thing that we have is this world makeover guide, which gives sort of five quick step-by-step um, -step activities to get you started on um, attracting more wildlife and for different kind of motivations. So a log pile is a really quick thing that you can do. A mini pond is something that will bring the most wildlife to you and so on. Um, and then each of these five activities, as one example of them here, are sort of illustrated with these kind of step-by-step -step ways that you can quickly follow in your own space and so making a kind of container pond here out of an old washing up bowl or whatever you might have to hand. And then we also issue monthly tips. So every month, a kind of, uh, seasonal sort of topical idea for some one kind of quick thing that you could do so for example in, in May we supported the no mo may campaign and talked about how you could just let your grass grow long or plant a, a mini meadow um, and see see what comes along or if you haven't got much space create a green roof on your shed or bin store or whatever you might have and then on our website, we have what we call these kind of pattern drawings, which are, um, go through lots of these different activities that you can do and talk about the kind of design considerations for integrating them in, into a kind of urban setting. So with the example of, of the creating a gap in your fence to things like hedgehogs need much more space than just one kind of tiny urban plot to get enough juicy slugs to eat. So thinking about how you can create these gaps, what size they need to be, how you need them in all, um, all of your boundaries with your different neighbours, obviously in consultation with them to make the most of not just your garden, but thinking about it as that whole neighbourhood, that whole um, city's worth of gardens. Yeah, and that, that was my slides to answer those questions. Thanks, Sean. And then, yeah, I, I was, I wanted to say earlier, I really want to get one of those invisible bird feeders because you get to really, you can just pop them on your window, right? And then really see all the birds come right to your window, which just sounds like a superpower. Um, and then of course, like underlining, because we're speaking of our streets, um, yeah, the importance as well of, of not having pesticides uh, sprayed on our streets to really encourage that wildlife to be able to come and, and stay and feel safe. Um, so yeah, we'll put in the in the links um, our pesticide free towns campaign, which is a campaign you can join to uh, yeah get your council to stop spraying on your streets. Um, but yeah, I guess we we were looking at sort of the individual level, and then I kind of want to finish um, on a more macro level of um, yeah, what does a green city look like in a way? I know it's, it's quite a big question, but 
um, how does that bring the city together as a whole or how do we think on a macro level? Um, and I'll go to Carol first, then maybe everyone can just add a few words to it. Um, but yeah. Well, I think it's really more connectivity with the various projects which you are seeing on your screen. I think there's dialogue to be had and actions to be taken, really, because we are in our little villages, aren't we, really? And um, I think that's, that's how you get progress and seeing what Paul's doing there with the blue space as well, because that's important. Because in near to me is, of course, the Thames, which does run in Essex. I have checked, um, Paul, and I will be at the River Roading tomorrow because I work in Essex. Um, so, yeah, I, that's what I, that's how I see. I think it's, it's linking up, it's sharing ideas, it's, it's getting those communities that we move within to see the benefits of what other people are doing. Because sometimes you work in a silo and that's just how it is, you know, because, uh, so that's what I would think to get these things. And yes, I, I know the work that the National Park City are doing and we are in National Park City Week, um, but it's, it's important that those voices are diverse as well, you know, and that you take into people into account what knowledge people already have because I think a lot of the time that that's also ignored so yeah culture and history that's it that's my contribution does anyone else have anything to add quickly and then we can go to maybe one question yeah I'd, I'd add to that because I think you know this idea of what brings people together and I think in green spaces um social hierarchies dissolve um, you know, it, the concepts of a level playing field and of common ground are these phrases that we have that exist in metaphor, but they ex they're based on reality and the way that people can interact when we're on these in these natural environments. And I think um, the more that we bring people together in these environments, the, the more tightly knit we can be as, as communities, the more we'll learn from each other. I, I was going to say that what, what makes a green city in broad terms is, is twofold. It's giving space for nature and giving humans access to that nature. And in terms of giving space, we just, a lot of the time we actually need to back off. And I think sometimes it can be over-designed what we're trying to do. So much of development where there is green space, it just looks like really sad grass or a couple of manky saplings amongst this like huge areas of paving and concrete. And that's not nature. Like it actually just needs some space just to go wild and for random plants to come in. And human access is so important. We need to make sure that as many pathways as possible are opened up along our river. We're campaigning to have one opened up all the way along the roading. And you kind of look at it and think, why hasn't that happened? And also access to, to rivers and to ponds. Like there should frankly be a wild swimming spot in every borough in London. And the fact there isn't is shocking. And we have to imagine just how much joy and um, connection to nature we brought about by that one simple, not particularly expensive thing. And why, why we don't have that. Yeah, definitely right now access to a wild swing pot would, would be nice. <laughs> so hot. And Sean, any any last words to, to add? Yeah, I just have to contradict tr that a bit as a designer and, <laughs> and, and fight for um, that these spaces just aren't very well designed and not by people who know anything about wildlife. So I think it's important to still have design in some of these spaces and then that can help to alleviate some of the perception issues by sort of contrasting um, the messiness, if you like, of, of wildlife with uh, geometric forms and so on. So I think there's a role that design can play in making wilder spaces acceptable to people mm -hmm. who don't find them acceptable, but I think it has to be done well and often it's not done well. Yeah. Uh, there's a really interesting example of that right nearby of the happy the happy man tree which had to be cut down when everyone wanted it to stay but it got cut down because the designers hadn't taken into account this this old tree that one tree of the year and um and it was just a matter of a few of a few meters that had been over planned for it's it's wild and it did end up getting cut down despite incredible protests but yeah, it's an interesting, uh, it's a really good point, Sean. I think, yeah, I think they don't contradict. I think they completely uh, complement each other, this idea of um, designing in wild spaces and really um, having that as a core element of our, of our cities. Um, we're running out of time, so I think it's just a really great 
point to um yeah to point to everyone's social media to everyone's work it's yeah we're incredibly lucky to have these speakers with us today and they make their work uh publicly available so through sean's uh newsletters and all these incredible websites and instagram handles and twitter handles so do have a look in the chat uh, we'll try and put them there again um and really really briefly is there anything that people want to sort of tell everyone to look into um i don't know uh, yeah I, I can share my promo slide, which was just my last slide, if that's OK. It just has um, those links on. And someone asked in the chat, yes, you can see all of those things on the, on the website and on social media. So all the drawings that are on my slide, rewildmystreet.org and at rewildmystreet on Twitter and Instagram. And you'll find lots of um, information and guidance under those sections and resources. Amazing. And then Ellen has just popped a link to a petition. Yes, this is the petition to make contact with nature a human right. If you believe everyone should have access to nature, that it should be a right for all, not a privilege. Please sign the petition, share it with everyone. I'm sure there's loads of people on this call who are behind this and um, that your friends will be too. So please sign and share. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I was Ellen. just going to say, if, if, you're, if you're interested in broader rights of nature stuff, then do follow uh, Lawyers for Nature on Twitter at Law for Nature. Um, the River Roading um, is more on Facebook. Um, if you're in London, I mean, even if you're not, but if, particularly if you're in London, if you ever want to come and do like practical river work, our main volunteering is in autumn and spring for various reasons, mainly because you can't get into these reeds any other time. Um, and um, if you want to come and get dirty cleaning out a river or plant trees or put in benches, all that kind of thing, then we put our volunteer days on our Facebook group, Friends of the River Roading. And as much historical trivia and interesting things about the roading that you can take a stick out so amazing and carol the, i mean yeah we've popped the link in the chat as well but. yeah we, we it does follow us on twitter and instagram because um mm. it's, we don't it's not just about um the community gardening and that because we've got all sorts of scenes with the black outside festival mm. with debates with dj sets and practical things and charity plant sale coming up and we go back home to our spiritual home of Brixton for Black History Month, where we'll be discussing urban nature and architecture. We don't mind mingling with architects, actually. We're allowed. Um, and urban planners, because we're them type of feisty people. So, yeah, follow us. We're good fun and we like to get stuff done. That's a great, great last quote. Um, so yeah, so this was the last event in the Reassembling Our, series, uh, Our Cities uh, series, but uh, you can rewatch all the events. So if you haven't yet, I know a lot of people have been following through, uh, so that's amazing. But if you haven't seen the other ones, uh, we do have them all recorded and this event was recorded too. So you can rewatch those and you can share them with anyone you think uh, should be watching them. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Pan UK, so Pesticide Action Network uh, UK is also a charity and we also do incredible work specifically on pesticides. So if you're interested in um, either just sending a quick email, we have an action where you can just get in touch with your council and find out where your council's at on its journey to going pesticide free. Um, and that can be the extent of your action, or you can choose to get more involved and join a campaign. So I run the pesticide free towns campaign. Um, and yeah, you can you can try and get your council to go pesticide free. Uh, so we kind of we do recommend that. And you know, it's all fairly low, low um time consuming. So you can do that in conjunction with other great efforts. Um but yeah, I will leave it at that and do follow all these incredible speakers. And thank you so much to all four of you for joining me today um and sharing your yeah, your really inspiring projects. And I know that I will be yeah, visiting a lot of those very soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.